So first up, we have the wonderful James Lywood from Battlehurst Farm. James is going to be talking to us about increasing herd size while saving time and improving cow health. So James farms in West Sussex. Battlehurst Farm is an Arla premium farm, already renowned for having a very healthy herd with a consistently low cell count. The goal was to increase herd size while staying in the same parlour. The best way to achieve this was to speed up the milking process while retaining consistently high standard. James is very kindly going to disclose to us how he's achieved this, as well as how overall herd health has improved even more. So thanks ever so much, James. I will hand over to you. Thank you, Karen. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, tonight, I'll be giving everyone an insight about my farm's mini herd expansion, along with uh, how ADF has improved our milking performance and herd health. Uh, next slide, please, Jay. Um, so I'll start with a quick farm overview. Uh, so I farm with my father at Battlehurst Farm in West Sussex. Uh, where we're currently farming 300 acres at Battlehurst and a further 100 acres off the farm. So farming around about 400 acres in total. Um, currently the herd size is sitting at around 200 cows, with a plan to be at 230 cows by end of this year, beginning of next year. We currently sell our milk to Arla and we are uh, Arla co-op members on a Tesco contract. The cows are milked twice a day through our 1818 milking parlour um, where we're all year round calving and ADF was installed in August 2020. Um, I've also displayed some uh, KPIs we want to look at. Um, so we're currently averaging 11,400 litres at 4.6 fat, 3.5 protein, with a cell count at 109, back to scan seven. Uh, we've currently treated four cases of mastitis uh, with antibiotics within 12 months. Uh, pregnancy rate is currently sitting at 33%, uh, lameness sitting at 6%, and we're currently at 93% of cows receiving just seeds that dry off um, and a 23% replacement, replacement rate. Uh, next slide please, next slide please Jade. Um, in June uh, 2020, we made the decision to increase the herd size from 180 cows to 230 cows with the aim to milk around 200 cows with roughly 20 to 30 dry cows. We made the decision to expand the herd due to good business performance in the previous few years, being on a good milk price, uh, myself coming back into the far family business and wanting to grow the business, and also we bred too many dairy heifers. Um, uh, so as a result, it fell into place quite nicely, um, and it was a pretty easy decision to make in the end. So in order to increase cow numbers, we had to invest in three areas. Firstly, the milking parlour. In, in 2018, we actually fully revamped the milking parlour, stripping out all the old equipment uh, and installing all new milking equipment with an extra, extra milking point on each side. Um, and then in, two, uh, in August 2020, we then installed ADF uh, in order to milk the extra cows. We've already put up a new silage pit, which can store around a thousand tons of silage. And we're currently in the process of putting up a new dry cow shed. Uh, next slide, please, Jade. Um, the main reason why we installed ADF was to be able to milk an extra 40 cows twice a day without increasing milking times. Whereas before we knew if we added another 40 cows, it would at least add another 30 minutes onto milking. Um, we also wanted to make uh, the milking procedure less labour intensive by taking out the post milking part of the routine, saving a couple of minutes every row. Um, yeah, we just wanted to make the milking, um, milking routine easy and simple for everyone who's milking on the farm. Another reason for installing ADF um, was to make the post milking routine uh, more consistent and precise. Um, 
it's great to have the peace of mind knowing every cow has been ditched straight after she's finished milking and the iodine is being uh, applied exactly where it needs to go with minimal waste. Also, knowing every cow uh, that has been milked, that cluster has been cleaned and sterilised, um, resulting in no mastitis being spread from cow to cow. Finally, it's always nice, and it's also very nice to always uh, have uh, up-to-date milking technology in the parlour to ensure that we continue our, our high levels of performance. Uh, next slide, please, Jade. At Butterworth Farm, we carry out a strict mastitis protocol and milking routine. This is to ensure the best possible results and to reduce the amount of mastitis along with le using less antibiotics. We try and keep the milking routine as easy and simple as we possibly can. We start the routine by spraying the teats with, an, with iodine, followed by cleaning and stimulating the cows with a dry wipe. Then the cows are ready for the cluster to be attached. We pre-milk any cows with high cell counts or, or mastitis troublemakers, which are identified with red tail tape. Once the row of cows has, fin has finished milking, we check every cow for good teat coverage, along with checking all the mastitis detectors. If a mastitis is detected during milking, we also have a protocol to follow. Firstly, we milk, we milk the healthy, quarter, healthy quarters normally and then dump the infected quarter. Once the infected quarter is milked out, we then strip that quarter out until there's no milk left in the quarter. We then rub uh, udder cream on the infected quarter. Uh, once the cow leaves the parlour, we then move that cow into a, uh, we, we move the cow out of the main milking herd and into a um, mastitis slash um, lame slash sick group we have, um, where she's giving pain relief daily and drenched twice a day with 40 litres of water. That cow is then monitored closely for the next few days, monitoring her health and rumination Using the, using the collars we have on the cows, along with monitoring the quarter itself. If the, if the quarter and the cow's health is improving, then this protocol is continued until the quarter is fully cured. If the quarter worsens along with, the, with cow health, then we might consider administering antibiotics. Uh, next slide, please, Jade. Since we installed ADF, We've seen improvements across all boards. Firstly, milking times have been reduced by 30 minutes, allow allowing us to widen milking intervals. Mastitis rates have halved from uh, eight cases to four cases uh, of mastitis being treated with antibiotics in the last 12 months, um, which, uh, which has been achieved by having the cluster flush, um, which stops the spread of mastitis and having a, a more precise uh, post-dipping. Post post um, the whole milking procedure seems a lot cleaner, uh, leading to lower back to scans and a drop in cell count from a rolling 12 month figure from 126 to 109. Um, they def also help us to reach our goals, which are to treat no mastitis on the farm and also to reach 100% all sealant at dry off. Um, um, also, when the invents were installed into the ADF, we noticed a slight increase in milk yield, along with better milking performance. We, we noticed uh, better milking comfort, so less kicking off units, less fidgeting, and the cows milking out a lot, a lot quicker and also milking out them slow cows uh, slightly better. Um, and finally, um, all, all milking staff uh, love the ADF, they're very happy with it, and it's made milking quicker and less uh, labour intensive for them. Um, yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, and uh, thank you very much for listening to my presentation tonight, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have.
That is brilliant, James. Thanks ever so much for nipping us through that. Very much appreciated. Um, we do have a couple of questions, actually. Um, James, did you expect that installing the ADF system would save you as much time as it has done, especially considering that you have increased your herd size? Um, I knew it would save a lot. Of, I knew it would save a certain amount of time, but I was surprised um, that it saved as much time as, as it did. Um, we never intended to widen our interval, but um, before the ADF, we were pretty happy with the time we were starting and, and finishing, and it sort of made sense to, to widen it. The cows are benefiting as well. Uh, you know, slightly less milk on them in the mornings, which which will help with mastitis too, less stress on the other. Definitely, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, we're over the moon with it really. Um, and, and also saving that much time, um, there's more time in the day to do other stuff. So to trim a cow's fur, to, you know, do a bullying check or to carve a cow, there's just more time in the day. Um, to do other stuff, which is great. Oh, that's brilliant. And um, we've got a question here from Angela. Um, are the cows housed all year round and what bedding are they on, please, James? Uh, so, uh, no, well, the high yielders are in all year round, but we, we graze um, our low yielders and dry cows in summer and we're on sand bedding. And is that deep sand beds? Deep sand bed, yeah. Yeah, deep sand beds. Excellent. Okay, thank you. Um, how can you tell that your cows are more comfortable with the invent system from ADF? You did refer to this in your presentation, but if you could just expand a bit more, you know, you said about less kicking off the clusters and things. Yeah, just less fidgeting, less yeah, less clusters um, being kicked off, um, less poo in the parlour. You know, just they just seem more chilled out. They want to come in. They're in. They're out. No hassle um yeah and it's yeah they just seem to be milking milking better yeah amazing I, yeah. um we have got a couple more questions if that's all right james sorry it, it's yes, all coming yeah, in yeah, thick yeah. and fast here and um, so dan higgins what sort of success rate have you been having with treating mastitis with just adamant and pain relief i mean judging by those four cases treated with antibiotics a pretty good success i would say but yeah so i say um so we probably are running at around about um, six cases per hundred for mastitis in general, whether they've been self-cured or antibiotic. So, yeah, I mean, what would that be? So, yeah, 90%, I don't know, 80, 90%. Yeah, it, it, it's, yeah it's, it's just about finding it early, hitting hard, um, stripping out, underminting, pain relief, yeah, drenching. Uh, and yeah, just mo uh, using our um, collars we have as well, um, monitoring their yeah, monitoring their health that way. And yeah, okay. it seems to work. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. That's brilliant. Um, why do you give pain relief and drench them instead of giving antibiotics? That's from Sam Chandler. So it's a bit related. Um, so um, antibiotic usage in the whole dairy industry is a big topic. Um, You'll be amazed what cows can get over. They're great animals and they don't need antibiotics to cure mastitis. They will self-cure. If you're feeding them a good diet, they're getting in calf, they're not lame, or, you know, milking parlours, spot on. Um, they will self-cure. Um, and it's interesting, actually, I actually worked on an antibiotic-free uh, um, dairy herd in Shropshire. Um, on my university placement and going from my farm where obviously we're using antibiotics to an to a antibiotic free dairy herd was a real eye opener and I tried to bring as much of that back home as I possibly could and I and even with our cows being a lot higher yielding where I was on placement I was amazed personally of what a cow can do and you just got to give them, give them that chance. Don't just jump in with the antibiotics. Um, yeah, pain relief, drenching, other mint, um, and just monitoring them. I think that's, yeah, yeah. 
Amazing. Um, James, we have got a considerable amount of questions flying in, but in the interest of time, if it's OK with you, we're going to have to move on. We will try and come back to them at the end if we if we get chance. And if not, the ADF team will try and feed back these qu questions to to everybody, you know, to all of the participants, yeah. if that's OK. That's Thanks awesome. ever so much, James. I'm very no much. Worries, yeah. Brilliant. Um, can I also remind you all um, to please send the questions to Natalie? Um, if you just click down those little arrows on the chat function, you should be able to send them to Natalie and then she can send them my way. That would be fantastic if that's OK. Uh, right. We're moving on to Bill Higgins at Wilderley Hall Farms. Bill is very kindly going to talk to us about how our herd has consistently achieved world class lifetime daily yields. Um, so uh, Bill is there in, in lovely sunny Shropshire, although he has had a bit of rain, I think, because he's managed to do his first cut silage, which we're all very envious of. Um, Bill and his family have previously won the RABDF Gold Cup and they take a real pride in their milk quality and yield. Bill is going to share with us the secrets of his success in achieving a world-class milk yield. So stay tuned for ADF milk founder James Duke afterwards, um, who will be revealing their exciting new technology which will revolutionise your milking. So Bill, thanks ever so much for joining us this evening and I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Okay. Cheers everybody. And a special cheers to James Duke from um, Andrew and myself. Uh, just before I start the presentation, we put the ADF in. We're trying to work it out today. We're not sure. It's something like 2006 or 2008 we first um, went with ADF. Um, but we can't remember. So we're on our second system. It's been refitted in 2014. So, yeah. So brief intro to the business. Um, that's Andrew on the left and me on the right. Um, so... <sighs> We run a, a, it's a three generation family business. Uh, it, we try to keep things simple and protocol driven as a business. So um, we try to maintain standards. We try to organize everything. We try to have a plan for everything. We try to protocol everything so that we can attract, employ and continue to employ fantastic people. We're very fortunate to have a wonderful team of staff around us. A lot of them have been with us a very long time now and um, they don't want to go away but most of those type of people want to milk really good cows that are high yielding don't get sick and um, ADF has played a part in that uh, if you'd like to move on to the next slide please Jade so um, roughly 527 cows as you can all read 13,542 litres sold at 39 fat, 327 protein, which is getting us to 998 kilos of solids. Um, hopefully at the end of April, we should just about crack the thousand kilos, which will be the first time for us. Um, again, we try to run a simple system. So we've got one milker diet, one dry cow diet, and one young stock diet. Um, milker diet is based around uh, grass silage. We do five cuts of grass silage. And as Karen's mentioned, we've just fortunate enough managed to whip off first cut, uh, cut Sunday and picked up or started picking up Sunday night and finished Monday. Um, so that's in the bank and we're really, really pleased with that. It uh, looks really, really good. So uh, so it's five cuts of silage, but principally the milkers have first cut and second cut, a little bit of um, fifth cut and then third cut grass silage is our fibre source. We replaced the chopped straw in the diet. So we're running about three and a half kilos of third cut silage to give us our fibre background. Um, it's then made up with uh, traffic gold, soda wheat, um, bread, uh, soya, rape meal, uh, minerals, golden flake, yeast, and water. So we wet those diets down to about 42% dry matter. The main aim of what we're trying to do consistently as a team is to actually let the cow do what she really wants to do. So we are, we're there just to actually at the beck and call to support the cow and try to give her every chance that we possibly can to do what she naturally wants to do. Um, so we really focus on maximising time to eat, time to drink and time to, time to lay down. So from that point of view, all the water tanks are cleaned out once a week. We've actually fitted um, 30 something metres of feed barrier um, away from the parlour. But in that holding area, whilst we're scraping up, bedding down and feeding, um, so that cows, as soon as they exit the parlour, they can go straight out onto water and then straight onto feed. 
that barrier is now providing, and we can't get our heads around it, we're struggling to get the food in it. They're taking 20% of their daily intake within the milking time in that barrier, because literally they want to come out the parlour, they want to drink, they want to eat. So we're trying to maximise their time and their ability to eat. eat. Um, we were involved in a trial with Nottingham University about housed cows. I should have mentioned that we milk three times a day, obviously, and they're fully housed. Um, we were averaging over 14 hours a day lying times on our cows, even though we're not running a particularly big pile, which I'll come on to. Next slide, please, Jade. So pile has been in since 1995. Uh, it's not flash, keeps getting added to, tidied up extra bits. As I said, ADF was refitted in um, 2014. So from a milk quality point of view, uh, 13 back to scan, 82 cell count, 22 cases of mastitis in the last year, which works out at 4.2 cases per 100 cows. Uh, we use no antibiotics for drying off. It's teat sealant only now. We stopped using antibiotics for drying off because basically the tubes kept going out of date because we were achieving so few. So we've just given it up now so we don't bother. Um, the milking routine is very simple. It's literally, uh, we brush the cow's teats with a Northern Dairy brush. Uh, we allow an 85 second de um, time delay between brushing and cupping up. The important things, the golden rules of how we milk our cows is no touching the teats, no staff. The only teats that are actually touched by hand are fresh cows and mastitis cows. So fresh cows is to remove the orbiseal and mastitis cows obviously to strip and see what's going on. Uh, we have low yield monitors in the parlour to actually flag up if there's a problem. Uh, and obviously we've got some really good staff who are really all over it. And, you know, machine comes off low yield. They can feel when they're actually um, brushing the cow's teats as well. You can feel different tone in, in the udder as well. So it is normal. It's a 22-22 parlour. Um, they can still put through, even with our yields in the good going, they can put through 170 cows an hour. Uh, and an overall average, they do about 130 to 140 because we group the fresh cows. We have a fresh cow group on cubicles and a um, special care unit, which is for the older cows with big bags when they calve and anybody who needs a bit of TLC on a loose shard. We've also um, separated out the 22 slowest cows and moved them out of the main herd into what was our original fresh cow accommodation, which is, it's okay, but it's not as good as what we've got now. And we took them out of the main milking group because obviously with random slow cows in the size, it was slowing down milking time. Started that slow cow group. And interesting enough, that slow cow group will eat 75 kilos of food a piece and produce an average of 50 litres. And they take over 10 minutes to milk. But what it did was it knocked out, 50, so it knocked out 20 minutes of milking and able to milk another 50 cows. So uh, milking times are five in the morning, one o'clock at lunchtime, eight o'clock at night. We... Um, so we can milk the cows, uh, normally it's two in the parlour in the day and um, one out on the yard scraping and shifting cows. On a night we drop down to two, um, but we don't change any of the routine. The ADF has given us a real big hand with consistency, and obviously it's been in there a long time. Um, but we know that those cows teats are actually getting dipped three times a day at 11 o'clock at night when nobody's looking. We get that quality, we don't get the cross contamination, and uh, you know, we get fantastic reliability out of it. Uh, next slide, please, Jade. I'm going to do a short and sweet presentation because I like to be, um, I let people have questions, but this picture speaks a thousand words, really, like, and it's about actually giving the cows what they want, and it's giving them somewhere nice to live and uh, plenty of clean water plenty of food and no stress. So uh, as you can see, we're pulling 3,710 litres of forage at the moment and our lifetime daily yield currently is um, 20.53 kilos. It is, um, as I said earlier on, it is down to having a fantastic team of staff around us um, who buy into what we're trying to achieve. You know, me and Andrew lead from the front and um, to surround ourselves with these guys is um, guys and ladies is fantastic. So uh, yeah, so thank you to them. So that's it. That's me. That's me, short and sweet. And uh, see what anybody's got to say.
thank you so much, Bill. That was absolutely fantastic. What a great run through. And um, just prior to coming online, I did notice your article in British Dairying as well. So uh, I, I'd, I'd urge you all to have a quick read of that as well. Very, very interesting. Um, thank you ever so much for that. We do have a few questions, if that's OK, Bill. Um, yep, so I, I, I don't know who this is from, but would you say that cow comfort is just as important as the rest of the milking routine? Yeah, cow company is everything because you want that cow to lie down as much as possible because when she's lying down, she's making milk and she's happy. She's cuddling. So you're trying to optimise. Cow comfort is everything. We have two um, main cow buildings and one which would be, is fantastic. It's a good shed, but it is a traditional shed with a central feed passage with two rows of cubicles. That shed compared to the shed I've just shown you there, which has got two rows of head to head cubicles, there is nearly one and a half litres a day difference between the two sheds, simply from wider passageways, better comfort, better cubicle design and more barrier space. And do you bed on the same in both sheds? Yeah, but the one is converted cubicles. They're slightly, there's nothing wrong with them. They, it's great. The cows do really, really well in there. But, you know, this is a this is a more a more up to date version. They're purpose built, sand built cubicles. So, uh, yeah with a nice, yeah, there's a nice curb on the back. So what we've done in the other shed is we've taken out the mat, they were pasture mats, uh, put six inch angle iron on the back and deep filled them with sand. Amazing, brilliant. So, it, but it goes to show that you can retrofit things, doesn't it? You don't yes. always yeah, have yeah, to, yeah, yeah. You don't always have to smash a building down and start not again. Everything, not everything we do is a, is, a, is a cow palace. We've got plenty of old buildings that we make work. Brilliant, that's fantastic, thank you. Um, Helen Dutton has just asked what your calving interval is, please. Oh, that's a good one. It's just over 400 days. So, um, and uh, days in milk is 200, if anybody wants to ask that question, because we have a bit of sport with that. So we don't serve cows after six lactation. We just let them milk on. So quite a few of them will go on to 1,000 days, 1,100 days. So, um, yeah. So, yeah, we don't, we don't get excited about that because the cows have got persistency and we're able to look after them. So uh, we sent a cull off today and she'd done over 135 tonnes She'd done 33,500 um, 33 kilos in her last lactation, which was 785 days. So, uh, yeah. So, chair, Chair's prerogative then, what's your average lactation number? Like, how long do cows stay in your herd, roughly? Uh, but basically, it's 23% our cull rate is. So, uh, yeah. Fantastic. Um, I don't want to get this wrong, but Sayaka, I think this is, um, do your cows ever step outside, Bill? Every day. <laughs> every day because they all have loafing yards and uh, yeah they don't go on grass but they have all of the all of the adult animals have loafing yards and outside space it's very important to have that outside space we're an unusual farm quite a few people have been to visit us over the years but um the road goes straight through the middle of the farm cows exit the part onto a yard which is next to the road anybody and everybody can see what we're doing they can see into the carving yards they can see into the fresh cow yards they can see everything we're doing it's all on show the cows walk past the road, next to the road. Anybody can see what we're doing. Perfect. Angela's just asked, what was the name again of the brush that you use pre-milking, as that seems key to your low somatic cell counts? It's, yeah, I, no, I never let anybody run away with the fact that it's one particular thing. There is lots of things that we do that add to the whole picture. So it's a Northern Dairies brush. So, Northern um, Dairies it, brush, there we go. It's Northern just a Dairies it's brush. A, it's a, no, it's a motorised brush which actually puts warm water and paracetic onto the teats. So, um, and it, it literally is just scrubbing the teats and it is obviously sanitising them, but it's also um, stimulating the milk let down. But the crucial thing is stopping people touching teats and having the sufficient milk let down, milk let down time. Because Perfect. there's no point in cupping a cow up that's not ready to let the milk down. So you need that lag. So we would normally in a team of twos, brush, leave a five cow, delay and then cup up so yeah work as a team of two amazing brilliant and how do you ensure that you keep a consistent level of milk quality is it all of those factors that you've just described and uh well andrew's a breeder and i'm a feeder so between us we come at it in two different directions so i work alongside a guy called will tully who's been our nutritionist for a number of years and it is about presenting the same diet every day a really, really good diet, having good forages and consistency. James feeds the cows most of the time, does a fabulous job, and me and Andrew back him up as well and cover him. So, uh, yeah, it's about consistency. Bore them to death with a really, really good diet. That's what they want, and that's what their rumours want, definitely. It is, um, yeah. 
Max Mitchell has just asked, what is your mastitis treatment protocol, please? <laughs> so um, we would look at supportive care. So um, this is going to outside, outside, like I said, I'm a feeder. So it's a little bit outside of my, uh, my usual scope. But basically, we would do supportive care. Initially, if we've got somebody with some clots, we will monitor it and we'll go in with pain relief. Um, we then will go in with, uh, ultimately, if we have to treat them, we'll go with an antibiotic tube and then we will start, you know, we'll, have, we'll see if they need drenching, whatever supportive care they need. Normally, most cows only need nine tubes. So it is literally a tube. We don't use any injectables to back it up. We have very little E. coli. So it is a Tetra Delta tube and um, it's mainly pain relief. So it is Keloprofen, Ketofen, Ketofen, whatever you want to call it, whatever is your, your choice of pain relief, but it's mainly pain relief and as James earlier said if the cow is in a good environment having a good diet it is healthy and strong they will deal with that and get over it and antibiotics is probably going to do them more harm than good generally I speaking I probably shouldn't compare myself to a cow bill but having suffered mastitis myself I'm so heartened that that your first port of call is pain relief for that cow because it does yeah. hurt it is um, we, we, it's, we, you know we Years ago, we used a lot of antibiotics. Now we use a lot of pain relief because basically you are all there to do is to support them, to give them a chance to do what they want to do. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Um, just one more question. How did winning the Gold Cup affect you and your farm? Um, <laughs> uh, me and Andrew always joked about sticking her head above a parapet. So a very, very proud moment in our career. Dad has always followed it closely and it's one of his um, key aims in life was to win it. And for, uh, and for us to be able to de deliver it was yeah, so cool. So what it does is introduce you to an, a wider sphere of people and get you through doors that you never thought you could walk through. Um, it's a fantastic thing. It's a fantastic achievement. And, you know, we're just a couple of, you know, we're just a bunch of people on the side of hill having a go like so it's cool. Well, I think that's very modest of you. I think you're doing an exceptionally good job there, Bill. Um, just one final question before we have to move on. Um, Helen Dutton's just asked, do you feed twice or once a day, Bill? Uh, I feed twice a week if I'm lucky, but anyway, yeah. <laughs> no, we feed once a day. It is literally once a day feeding. So, uh, you know, And then from a nutritionist perspective, I'll take Chair's prerogative here. Do you, how often yeah. do you push up feed? Oh, God. Yeah, we... we really anal about that stuff so we push up probably six times a, six times a day at least but we're into um we gather up all the rejects every day on the open fronted barriers and we weigh back the rejects because the rejects go as the basis of our heifer diet so we we target three percent rejects and we clear up all the rejects because i don't want the cows to ever run out of food because that's a big no-no um so we target three percent rejects clear that up and put that into is the basis for 150 efforts for their basic diet which is then diluted down with fifth cut chop straw and rape meal and minerals so uh, yeah so it is about having the cow having the time to eat all the food she wants to eat so they're clearing over 28 dry matter kilos 15 point nearly 15.2 kilos of that is forage it's about them having the time to do the job that they want to do Oh, I've just thought of loads of questions, but I know that Natalie's yeah, going to be yeah. on my case in a minute. Um, honestly, what a fantastic panel of farmers you've got in front of us here, James. It's so exciting. Uh, Bill, thanks ever so much for your time and for your honesty. And um, if we get a chance, we might come back and ask a few more questions afterwards, if, if that's OK. Um, right. So now it gives me the great honour to introduce James Duke to you all, ADF Milking. Um, James is the director and founder of ADF Milking, and he has a background in agricultural engineering, particularly in the dairy industry, where he saw a gap in the market for a milking system that automatically dipped and flushed. He founded ADF in 2004, and the rest, as they say, is history. Today, he is going to reveal to us a brand new ADF product that is going to do wondrous things for milk yield, cow comfort and cow health, and ultimately, hopefully, make all of your jobs a lot easier. So without further ado, James, I will pass on to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. And thank you to James and Bill for that, uh, those two marvellous pre presentations. At ADF, um, we have a passion for delivering practical solutions um, and our new focus is on revolutionizing the actual milking 
Um, Bill touched on this earlier. Cow comfort is absolutely paramount. Um, and this evening, I'm excited to reveal this new product. Um, the initial feedback we have has exceeded even our expectations. Originally, we were just looking to provide more cow comfort during milking, but uh, the feedback we've got um, has really exceeded our expectations. So, so our, our main focus at ADF is primarily healthy milking, healthy cows, improving milking speed and parlor throughput, um, calm, gentle milking, minimizing any stress or discomfort to the cows. Um, and if you get those top three things right, ultimately it brings improved farm profitability. Uh, so it's all self-financing. Um, we're always striving to develop new ideas and to identify areas for improvement. And in the past, I think, um, understandably, our reputation has been built on the post-milking routine. Um, but you can't stop looking. And we did identify an area that's uh, been in the industry for as long as I can remember. And it's to do with the selection of liners for a herd of cows. Um, and how do we go about that selection? And we tweak liners and we improve them or, or change liners. And basically all you do is move a potential problem from one area to another area because teat sizes vary between cows. An individual cow will have different size teats. Her back teats may be bigger than her front teats. Um, and then add on to that that a cow's teat changes in both size and texture during an individual milking, um, it complicates things even further. Um, so how do we select a liner to suit a farm? Um, we can't change liners mid-milking to suit those smaller teats or the larger teats. So if a liner isn't sized correctly, potentially we can get congestion in that teat uh, and the effect of that congestion um, can be reduced uh, milking speed, uh, reduced yield. In other words, you know, the cow isn't giving what she's capable of achieving. Um, and just a small um, swelling of the teat can bring significant increases in the case of mastitis. Um, so basically, we need to treat we need to treat teats uh, as individuals, and with intelligent venting, or our new product Invent, that's exactly what we do. Um, and we achieve um, we achieve this through uh, control of the vacuum within the liner. Going back to that liner selection, you know, we can only in the past select for a herd. And we, if we're lucky, we might get that right for 80% of the herd, but the 20% that we haven't got it right uh, could be our heifers because they've got smaller teats. Um, particularly important to look after our heifers. They're the future of the herd. We want their association with the milking parlor to be positive. Um, so the last thing we want to do is cause any discomfort from a misfitting liner. Um, and, and the other 20% are probably perfectly good cows that are just milking up to different flow rate and need different vacuum treatment. If we imagine a very fast milking cow, the vacuum in the claw is going to decrease with the milk flow. A slow milking cow is going to have higher vacuum in the claw. Higher vacuum in the claw has a greater potency to cause higher vacuum in the mouth of the liner. If I can just share my screen, I think it's probably better to describe this with uh, an animation uh, we produced early, earlier. Right. Natalie, sorry, can you see that screen shared now? Can indeed. You can. Good. So... If I can just explain what's going on here, we've got 
the screen split left to right. On the left hand side, I hope most people will recognize that as being a yellow ADF shell. And on the right hand side, we've just got a conventional shell and liner. Um, I've shown this at the end of milking, probably on a liner that isn't the best fit for this teat. But basically, we've got two identical teats here, or started identical teats at the beginning of the milking. And at this point here, we're at the end of the milking, and this teat has been subject to way too much hood vacuum. It's caused a swelling in the top of the teat. That swelling is restricting the milk flow because the swelling is not just going out, it's going in. So we've got slower milk flow. Um, it's, it's probably not that comfortable for that cow that, you know, it's, it, it could be uh, uh, causing some discomfort um, and stress. Um, we're likely to get incomplete milk out. So effectively we're helping to dry that cow off early and that teat will certainly have an increased, increased risk of mastitis. But up until now, we've not been able to do a lot about this, the, uh, the, the size of the liner or the, alter the performance of the liner. So if we now focus, uh, before I do that, I'll just, run the, I'll just run the video so we can just see what's happening. And we're gonna just run this first bit slowly. So as soon as the teat comes through the mouth of the liner, we're exposing the head of the line that's a basically full system vacuum. I'll just move that on a little bit, bang. So if I can just explain what we've got here, we've got a vacuum gauge measuring vacuum in the head of this liner, vacuum gauge measuring the head of the conventional liner, and then we've got a bolt tank on each side um, to give an indication of milk flow and uh, total milk volume. So if we let it play, We've still got high hood vacuum in the top of the liner. Because it's not the most comfortable, that cow is likely to start milking a little bit later. And because we've got a certain amount of congestion in the teat, she's likely to milk more slowly. Bill touched on stress earlier on, and um, there's nowhere where stress is more important than in the milking parlor, because any discomfort will promote Adrenaline, adrenaline will knock out oxytocin and that's gonna slow that cow down. So in this situation, this is not where we want to be. Now, if uh, we can now compare that to the other side of the cluster. And in fact, if you've got a, a, a cow where you know you've not got a great fit, you will actually see this if you split a cluster from a, a, a an ADF shell and a conventional shell. But if I go to the, back to the beginning and just explain what's happening on the other side, the ADF side of the, uh, the equation, within the head of the liner, we've got our existing um, valve that we use for um, coating the teat with disinfectant and skin conditioner at the end of milking, and also delivering our sanitized water to clean the liner between cows. Um, but we've actually modified this injector with this extra ball and a bias spring. So if we look at the mouthpiece chamber vacuum, and if we divide it into four sections, we've got this gray section at the front, zero to 10 kPa. This is the low vacuum section that we don't want to spend too long in because it's going to promote liner slip. Our sweet spot, is between 10 and 20, the green zone. This is where we want to be for as much of the time as possible. And the red zone is anything above 20 kPa. This is when we're likely to cause discomfort to the teat. So we want to be in this zone. Um, so it, if we get towards the red zone, our tube that's used to deliver the dip and water is now connected to fresh uh, supply of fresh, clean air. So the ball gets lifted off its seat, the air comes in and regulates that vacuum. And if, it, if for any reason, let's say towards the end of milking, when the teat 
loses its plumpness because it's not so full of milk. And again, we're prone to high vacuum and perhaps you see the cows paddling a little bit. Again, the vent will open and prevent that. So just running through uh, our ADF cluster. So we've got a high vacuum at the beginning. We're venting at a very high rate. We're into the safe zone. Milk flow, cows comfortable. Milk flow is increased, hopefully a little bit earlier on. We get a complete milk out, um, possibly with an increased flow rate, especially on a, a liner where the liner is not particularly well suited to the cow and a dramatically improved udder health going from uh, our feedback. So to, to sum up, we're venting with clean air. We're maintaining a healthy mouthpiece chamber vacuum. We're minimizing slip through vacuum control. We're not just opening the thing full out when we don't need to. And we're treating each teat as an individual. So for example, on a cow with uh, two smaller front teats, they're gonna get maximum venting when the back ones don't need so much venting, so we will vent them less. Not every teat requires venting, but generally the teats that do require venting are heifers and possibly some of the cows that because they need venting are slower. So they're holding a whole milking parlor up. When it comes to milking throughput, we can only milk as fast as the slowest cow. And I think to be quite honest, it's those 20% of cows that are giving you guys 80% of your problems. And those are the ones that are making the real difference. Um, our customer feedback um, has been amazing. Unanimously, everybody, immediate response, wow, the cows are calmer. Um, we've got some farms that, where we've literally switched on an extra uh, litre, or in one case two, but in, um, there was probably a reason for that um by getting the cows to milk out fully um many reporting faster milking a lot um uh commenting that the milking you know so when we look at individual milking times the cows times vary a little bit from day to day it, you know it's not so obvious but when you look at the overall throughput um and the time to milk start to finish reporting um that's speeding up and consistently um uh, improved other health fewer cases of mastitis lower cell counts um as always our, with our adf equipment it's compatible with any uh, equipment manufacturer and any parlor configuration uh, for our existing users it's a simple upgrade so it's backwardly compatible this can be added on to all our systems in the market uh, please don't hesitate to get in touch if you'd like any further info. Uh, thank you for listening. And Karen, I'm very happy to answer any questions. Fantastic. Thank you so much, James. Yep, we've got them flying in thick and fast here. Um, so, James, uh, this is a question from Graham Cooper. Taking the pressure off the top of the liner, what are your chances of getting liner slip, do you think? Um, if we were just to stick a hole through the side of the liner, um, then possibly uh, it would promote cluster slip. We had a farm, we've got a farm in Germany on Invent, um, and uh, we, we agreed to fit it on this farm. And then after the event, um, I was told the, the guy's having problems with cluster slip. I thought, oh, my life, and we're reducing the hood vacuum. But he's reported the cluster slip has gone. Now, I think he wasn't getting cluster slip. His cows were uncomfortable. They were jostling around and, and, and kicking units off. Um, but we are not experiencing any cluster slip at all. And, and I've been, you know, trying to promote it, I can assure you. So, um, you know, we are, remember, we are inventing in an intelligent way. We're keeping it in that window between 10 and 20 kPa. We can't keep it there all the time. You know, if we've got an incredibly small teat, 
it's going to be better than it was before. But for the majority of the cows, for the majority of the time, we're right in that green zone. We can only vent at a certain rate. And for the cows that are way outside that limit, we can certainly improve the situation. Our goal is between 10 and 20. But obviously, if you've got a very small heifer, it might be going up to 25 or 30. But then, my word, it would have been 40 before. Thank you. That's excellent. Mr Atkinson has asked, does this system affect liner life? Not at all. No, it'll have absolutely nothing to do with line life. But one thing that I would mention on line of life, um, you know, respecting the life of a liner is very important. When we think the way a liner works, it, it's got nothing to do with whether it's black or whether it's losing its surface. It's all to do about elasticity. When we stretch a liner into a shell, that's what gives it the elasticity to milk. And any elastic material will lose its stretch over time and eventually you end up with a bin liner just smacking the teat which is not a good place to be it happens slowly so the cows might not necessarily notice imme immediately but it will affect your yield it will affect the health of the teat and boy when you go to put new liners on it will upset the cows because all of a sudden the whole experience is totally different and cows are creatures of habit Great, thank you. Um, Tom Greenham has asked, what happens to the valve for the vent during wash? Does it remain fully open, allowing yep. air inflow? Very good question. Very good question. Um, uh, during um, the, the cluster only vents during milking. Um, so we have a green button that you push at the start of milking to initiate the ADF system. And at the end of milking, you've got a red button. As soon as you push the red button, it uh, cancels the venting. So during wash, you're not venting. Uh, great because question, otherwise we're going to be venting cold air into hot wash water and costing a lot of energy uh, and wasting that hot water. Great stuff. Thank you. Uh, Max Mitchell has asked, how much does mastitis cost the national economy? Oh, <laughs> Um, there are figures banded around, um, but basically high cell count knocks production. I mean, we, 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 we just don't want mastitis, uh, you know, just in morale is not a good thing. And, and a case of mastitis, depending on yield, can be, it depends who you speak to. Um, in Germany, they say it's 600 euros. I've always had a figure of about 280 pounds. It varies. Um, from farm to farm, depending on the value of the cows, the yield um, you're losing and um, the strain of mastitis, I suppose, to a certain extent. But it it's a big cost. It's one of the most avoidable costs, probably, in dairy farming. Well, it's great that so many are striving to reduce it, James. That's the thing. And we must continue that battle. Yes, we? yeah. And, and look, we just don't want to be there, do we? We, no. we want fit healthy animals we and, want healthy and happy cows because that healthy, gives us healthy happy, happy farmers with, with long lives giving lots and lots of milk we don't want loads of heifers because that's as bad as having a teenager in the house they'll just raid the fridge and give you nothing back we want mature cows that are going to convert food into milk how beautifully put uh, well in the interest of time james i think we'll have to move on if that's okay thank you ever so much for that very in insightful presentation there um, our next speaker is milking technology specialist Ian Onstad. Ian is internationally recognised for his research in milking technology and he leads the Dairy Group team of experts who provide independent advice on hygienic milk production and mastitis control. He is also the chairman of the British Mastitis Conference. Ian is very kindly going to discuss the effects of teat congestion on milk flow, milk quality and cow health. So thank you ever so much Ian, it's over to you. Thanks, Karen, for the invitation and um, good evening, everyone. Hope you're enjoying this seminar. Uh, anybody who knows me uh, knows that for years I've been fascinated by milking technology and milking techniques. It, it really floats my boat. Um, so when I was asked to look at the uh, invent technology, I, I had the, the presentation from James and uh, I have to confess it, it intrigued me. Uh, it seemed an interesting concept but I wasn't really sure on what the effects would be. So uh, it, was, it was great to have an opportunity to actually spend some time looking and monitoring these systems. Uh, so that's really what I'd like to discuss tonight. So if I could have the first slide, please, Jade. 
so really interesting it's uh, to hear it from from bill and and james uh, as practical dairy farmers it, it's interesting to hear that that the aim of milking uh, or machine milking it's predominantly remained the same for years uh, we all want to milk cows quickly uh, and obviously bill and james want to milk quickly they want to milk completely because we need to ensure that the others completely evacuated uh, that we're capturing all the milk that's readily available to be harvested but most importantly we want to milk gently and, and we've we've heard it on two or three occasions already this evening gently means comfortable and so we've got this compromise we've got to try and find a way of milking cows quickly completely and gently uh, next slide please Jade. so one of the uh, inevitable effects of, of milking a cow with vacuum is is that we get teat congestion uh, and basically congestion or thickening or swelling of a teat it is very basically it's the accumulation of circulatory fluids so that's blood uh, or lymphatic fluids and it's how it's these fluids accumulating around the teat barrel and around the teat base so the teat would begin to become slightly hard it would become uh, swollen and potentially in extreme cases quite discoloured. Now one of the reasons that we uh, or one of the ways that we can mitigate the adverse effects of pulsation uh, or of, sorry of congestion would be pulsation and, and one of the very first milking machines developed by a Scotsman called Mr Merkland failed singularly because it had no pulsation so there was no way to, to ease or mitigate uh, the accumulation of the circulatory fluids, so the teat became swollen, congested, and ultimately stopped milking. So we can manage teat congestion uh, with effective pulsation, but as James uh, just mentioned, we can also mitigate uh, teat congestion with having a liner and a teat that are adequately fitting. So a good match between the liner dimensions and the teat dimensions, so we get a good effective seal between the liner and the teat. Uh, next slide please. So this is um, a document that I, I refer to quite regularly uh, and, and I make no apologies for the fact that it's published in 1994 uh, and I would strongly suggest anybody who has uh, an interest in milk harvesting and machine milking gets hold of a copy of this because basically it's, it's a review looking at uh, teat tissue reactions to machine milking. And, and one of the very strong conclusions that came from this review was that any change to the teat tissue, the teat end and the teat canal will alter the risk of new mastitis infections. And we've already heard from, from Bill and from James that mastitis control and mastitis levels and mastitis incidence are absolutely critical to their farm success. Uh, next slide, please. So reducing teat congestion. So we can obviously uh, have effective pulsation. We can try and ensure that we have a, a good fitting liner that's, that's suitably fitted and matching to the teat dimensions. But the other things that we can do include avoiding low milk flow. Now, of course, low milk flow is, is, can occur at the beginning of the milking as well as at the end of the milking. Um, when we have low milk flow, we get a consequential increase in system vacuum around the teat. So when we've got a cow at peak milk flow, the vacuum that the teat is being exposed to will be reduced. So consequently, if we have a cow that's ba badly stimulated, exhibiting delayed letdown or bimodal milking, when the milk flow drops, the vacuum exposure increases. So if we're wanting to avoid low milk flow and as a consequence, higher vacuum, we've got to be really particular on pre-milking preparation. Uh, and and both, both the previous speakers have mentioned the importance of the routine. So adequately stimulating a cow, and that means stimulating her hard enough and long enough, but then leaving her to allow time for the milk letdown reflex to occur. And bearing in mind that a cow that's milked twice a day and a cow that's milked three times a day the cow milk three times a day requires leaving longer 
before we attach the cluster because she has a smaller cisternal capacity. So it's all about adequate stimulation and adequate lag time. So we want to avoid overmilking. So that's overmilking with delayed milk letdown at the start of the milking. But we also want to ensure that the ACRs are set appropriately so that we avoid overmilking at the end of milking. And again, difference between a herd milk twice a day and a herd milk three times a day, we would want the takeoff settings higher on a 3x herd than we would on a 2x herd. We obviously, it's a, it should be a given and it should be, uh, it shouldn't have to be stated. But of course, if we're talking about reducing teat congestion and vacuum exposure of the teat, it's critical that we have suitable system vacuum. So the actual system vacuum has to be set appropriately for the position of the milk line. Next slide, please. So building on the, the picture of teat congestion, why, why it's important, why we believe that it's, it's highly relevant, uh, I just wanted to share with you three, three papers. Uh, the first paper is uh, by an Italian group headed by Zucconi, and they were looking at teat thickness changes and, and the link with intramammary infections. When they were measuring teat thickness in increases, an increase of more than 5% was significantly associated with an increased infection rate. So we start to see teats becoming slightly congested. We worry about comfort or more accurately discomfort, but we also should be worrying about increased new infection rates. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this was uh, a piece of work done by uh, some colleagues in Belgium when they were looking at uh, milking machine induced changes and changes in teat dimensions. Uh, what they concluded was that any increase in teat barrel diameter after milking was associated with an increased quarter somatic cell count. So we've got two very reputable pieces of work suggesting that any changes in the physical teat dimensions after milking are going to be problematic. Uh, next slide please. And then this was a, a very recent piece of work um, undertaken at the University of Wisconsin uh, in 2017, where we were actually able to come up with a, a method of estimating teat canal, teat canal cross-sectional area, and then using that as a proxy to establish milk flow rate. And what we noticed as teat congestion began to develop within a teat, that we saw a reduction in the teat canal cross-sectional area and a consequential reduction in milk flow rate. So teat congestion, there's not much positive you can say about it. Uh, next slide, please. So we then started to look at the uh, effects of the invent in the ADF claw. And we were using um, guidelines uh, identified or developed with, by TCI, the Teat Club International. Uh, these are very industry accepted measures of teat ringing, teat congestion, and teat discoloration. When we're talking about teat ringing, this is where the, uh, the teat connects to the base of the udder. Uh, so we're looking here at three categories or three classifications. We're looking at a teat that has no ring, so the teat loop's absolutely normal. We're then looking at a category of a score of two, which is, is a visible ring. So a little bit like the mark your sock might leave on your leg if it's a little bit tight. So it's, it's visible, but it's not palpable. And the third category, which are the more serious uh, problems, is, is the palpable ring. So this is the, the ring at the base of the teat where it attaches to the udder, which is hard, and swollen uh, and quite, dis, uh, quite uncomfortable. We then rated teat congestion, which was a measure of uh, the change in the structure of the teat. Uh, and again, we were scoring that from no congestion to severe congestion. And then following that by looking at teat color, because obviously at the end of a milking, we're looking for a teat to be normal color. If we see a, a teat that becomes red, we're, we become concerned at that point. Teats that become blue, very, very concerned with that. So when we started to look at the, uh, the effect of the invent on the cluster, you can see that there's a highly significant reduction or difference, sorry, between venting and non-venting for both 
teat based rings, teat congestion, and teat discoloration. It's a highly significant difference. Uh, next slide, please. We then went on to look at the um, split cluster effect. So we had one side of the cluster uh, with the invent enabled, and the other side of the cluster was basically just operating as, as per usual or as normal. And, and again, we were using the same um, teat classifications of, of base ringing, teat congestion, and teat discoloration. Uh, these, these were done on two farms that, that were kind enough to um, offer up their cows for us to play with. But more importantly, just look at the overall results. So this is rather than uh, describing in detail farm one and farm two, look at the overall results. And again, you can see highly significant differences here. And when you actually look at the uh, ringing, teat congestion and teat discoloration, there's a significant improvement in all those three categories when the invent was fitted. Now, bear in mind, this is on the same cow. So some of James's comments about um, difference in teat size is, is taken out by the fact that we were doing this on a split cluster uh, design. But what it does show is if you look at the scores that were uh, relatively unaffected, it demonstrates very clearly that not all cows or all teats benefit from venting, but a significant number of animals do. Uh, final slide, please. So to conclude, teat congestion, uh, I think fairly well established, uh, teat congestion increases new infection rate. Uh, teat congestion reduces peak milk flow rate. The one, that, uh, the one point that I should add there is teat congestion significantly reduces cow comfort. And what we have been able to show is that the invent system will significantly reduce teat congestion. Thank you. Anyone got any questions? Fantastic. Thank you, Ian. Yes, we do have a couple of questions, if that's OK. Um, in your opinion, do you think that this, this new technology from ADF could improve farm profits? Anything that improves cow comfort um, and milkability is, is going to potentially be, yeah, it's, it's potentially going to be more profitable, of course. Particularly we're, if we're seeing the um, improved milking performance, we're not, not at the moment able to demonstrate a significant reduction in mastitis cases. Um, but I think that would be fair to say, watch this space. But, but basically- Do you think the only reason for that, Ian, is that we're still in relatively early days? Is that what you mean in terms of data? Yeah, I think that it's, yeah. it's relatively early days in what we've been monitoring, correct. No, that's brilliant. And in, in your opinion, um, would you say all herds would probably suffer some teat congestion? Or is that a sweeping generalisation? Oh, that's a very accurate generalisation. Uh, because fundamentally, it, it's the combination of, of liner, <coughs> liner fit to cow teat. And, and so all herds, all herds, irrespective of a milking system, irrespective of system vacuum, irrespective of liner design, will have some cows that, that will suffer from teat congestion. Unfortunately, it's, it's a given because you can never, as, as James said, until the day arrives where we have teats that are uniform within a cow and between cows, we will always have teat congestion. And as a consequence, we will always have uncomfortable milking for some some cows. And in your professional opinion, do you think we can get there? I, I, I think we can get there and I think we have to get there, correct. Very interesting. Right, sorry, I'm taking Chair's prerogative a bit to the limit here, aren't I? Um, so we've got a lovely question here from Chris Heenan. Why is the vent at the top of the unit? Is there a difference between vents being closer to the teat opening beneath the teat compared to having the vent at the top, like in ADF? Yeah, so the, I'm imagining that the question is referring um, to some unit or some milking liners that will have a vent in the short milk tube. And, and the benefit of the vent in the short milk tube is to, to help remove milk away from the end of the teat. 
it has no effect or minimal effect on the vacuum in the head of the liner. And, and as James's graphic showed, as the if the teat is ill-fitting in the liner, vacuum is going around the side of the teat into the head of the liner. We need some vacuum there because if we have no vacuum, the units will just fall off. But but it's the excessive vacuum that becomes problematic because while the liner is opening and closing, it's certainly helping to, to mitigate and reduce the teat congestion in about the bottom 25 millimetres of the teat. Yeah. But an opening and closing liner cannot mitigate the effects of vacuum on the teat barrel or around the mouthpiece. Okay. So that's where the, the vents required at the mouthpiece to, to stop the congestion building at the top of the teat. Okay, great. Again, Ian, we have got more questions. Um, if we do have chance at the end, we'll come back. If not, we'll put these questions to you and then we'll get them back to the people that ask them, if that's okay. Thank okay. you ever so much for your presentation and for your time. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, so now our final speaker, we're moving on to Keith Gew from Huddleston Farms. Um, Keith is also an award-winning farmer. My goodness me, we're so privileged to have all these award-winning farmers here, um, who runs Huddleston Farm with his father, Tim, in West Sussex. Keith is very passionate about developing a more profitable, more efficient, easier to manage cow, and is continuously driven to improve sustainability in dairy production. He's going to talk to us this evening about his milking routine and what practices can be beneficial to every dairy farmer. Thanks ever so much, Keith, it's over to you. Uh, thanks, Karen, and uh, thanks, James, and the ADF team for inviting us on. Um, so, uh, quickly, I'll start with a bit of an um, introduction to, to us as a farm. Um, we milk about 400 cows. Um, we're milking in an internal 32-point rotary. Um, we'll be what, uh, what we call 2.5x milking. So um, we have a low yielding group, which uh, is only milked twice a day, um, and they also graze. Um, the cows are all bedded on uh, mapses and with a sawdust uh, bedding material. Um, and um, yeah, on the next slide, there'll be um, a snapshot of our current 12 month rolling KPIs. Um, so, um, yeah, it's uh, nice to see we're sort of challenging Bill on his uh, 20 and a half litres per day of life. Um, and I guess we're going to talk about milk prep and the whole aim of milk prep is to make sure that we can have cows that are going to last as long as possible in our herds. And we're not um, giving them an opportunity to leave the herd early whilst they still have value to, to add to us. Um, we're also the number three genetic merit herd in the UK. Um, we classified a couple of weeks ago and we now have 122 excellent cows in herd. Um, so it's really important to us that we, similar to how Bill and James have both said, you know, maximize the comfort for these cows through all stages of, um, of their daily life um, to make sure that we're looking after them and, uh, and that they can continue to um, be profitable for us really, I guess. Um, so if we go on to the next slide quickly, um, so this is this is our parlour. Uh, you can see it's uh, I think it's looking too bad for a parlour that's now into its well coming up to its twenty second year of life. Um, our big aims for milk prep is to make sure we have the calmest milking process we possibly can. Um, so that means that we need to get those cows onto the parlour, prepped, milked, uh, and then dipped. Um, all within one turn of the parlour. So we run about a 15 second turn time. So that parlour from the from start to finish takes eight minutes to turn around. Um, so what we need to make sure is that that prep and milking process is as efficient as possible to make sure that we can get those cows milked in time for them to leave. Um, milking process is, is really important to us and it's got to be calm. You know, that comfort that we're talking about throughout this throughout this evening about milking uh, comfort whilst that liner is, is on the teat is great, um, but it actually starts way before the milking parlor. Um, actually for us, it really starts on the first milking out lactation. Um, we are very conscious 
that when we've got that cow who's just had a calf, especially heifers that have just had their first calf coming onto the parlour, we want that milking experience to be as positive as we physically can possibly make it. Um, we don't need to, we need to make sure the cows are coming onto the parlour comfortably at their own pace with as little stress as possible. Um, and we need to make sure that we're not over milking on that first experience because if we have cows and heifers with poor first experiences on the parlour, the chances of them having a good positive second experience is dramatically less. Um, so once we've nailed that first milking experience, we really try and then go all the way back out to the sheds. Um, and that's where milk prep really starts for us on a day to day. Um, so when those cows are leaving, leaving their yard and um, getting up off the beds, going into the collecting yard, you know, that process needs to be calm too. Um, if we, if we are, you know, loud um, shouting, trying to move cows too fast, um, then the rest of that milking experience is not going to be uh, calm. We need the whole, the whole of that milking experience for that cow to be calm. Um, I guess the next thing that's really important for us is that we make milk prep easy. So making milk prep easy really starts on the beds. You know, we're, uh, we don't have the luxury that uh, Bill and James have of being on sand. Um, and making sure that we've got clean beds that don't have any, uh, don't have excess uh, manure buildup and that are dry, comfortable, well bedded means that when we come to start our milk prep, we're not trying to clean off excessive dirt. Um, I guess our next step once we've got those cows in the collecting yard is to really when they start coming onto the parlour, you know, again, similar to getting those cows out, out of the yard, it needs to be calm. We have a zero tolerance rule on shouting and um, we will talk to the cows they come onto the parlor we don't shout uh, there is definitely no screaming um, and we try and have the entire process being as uh, cool and calm as possible um, we then go into a, a pre-milking uh, pre-milking phase we uh, dip every cow and strip every cow out we then have a 30 second lag for that dip to work. Um, we then wipe each cow off and then have a 90 second lag phase. So we're pretty strict enforcing that with the guys, you know, similar to Bill was saying, protocol is really key for us. Um, and you can actually see we have uh, on the floor rubber mats of this on this parlor. So, um, and each of the guys got one person uh, prepping and one person cupping. Um, and those guys need to stay on those rubber mats because that allows us to ensure that we have our 90 second lag phase between uh, cows wiped and units on. Um, we've got this sort of a bit of a phrase, Mario, she's the guy wiping at the minute, came up with it a couple of years ago, um, where a slow milking is a quick milking. The biggest thing that stops and stalls our milking times is cows that haven't finished milking but by the time we come to the end of the parlor and that we're waiting for them to finish. If we don't have great stimulation, um, by that I mean a really good strip and a great wipe, um, and if we don't make sure that we absolutely nail our lag times, um, and we and we if we're trying to go too fast and trying to get cows onto the parlour too quick, then all of that leads to uh, slower milking times. You know, if we get as soon as we start to get those cows coming onto the parlour and they're not comfortable and they're not calm we have that adrenaline increase. That means that we don't get the milk let down when we should. And all of a sudden those cows start to get uncomfortable. Um, and then when those cows get uncomfortable the first time, they remember it the second time. So they're less likely to come onto the parlor and equally before they've even stepped into the collecting yard, they're starting to respond to that negative event that they can see coming further down the line. So, I guess it's about trying to make sure that we absolutely nail everything from a protocol perspective every single time. Uh, the challenge for us is that, you know, that just isn't possible to be perfect. You know, we, we uh, an internal road is a hard place to protocol um, and uh, we can't be as consistent as uh, I look to with admiration on Bill's farm. Um, I think actually having listened to Bill this afternoon, there are probably some changes we can make to get a bit more consistent. Um, but the trick is for us is trying to reduce that risk. So we actually put 
the first invent lines into the parlor uh, just over 12 months ago when the trial started. Um, and the data we got back from that was amazing. So we were seeing cows um, that would milk out quicker. Um, but also the big thing for us is that, you know, we were seeing and um, we thought we had quite a lot of risk in that if we were got our lag times wrong yeah, and it, it happens for us, you know, we're definitely not perfect. Um, we think there's a lot bigger risk of over milking before those units come off rather than actually at the end of milking um, and milking those cows too, too long. Um, and the venting made a huge difference there. Um, for us, we've managed to speed up milk let down. I think similar to how Ian and James have been talking throughout the, the whole of the after, the whole of the evening's recordings, um, it's that we're really looking to help out the 20% of cows that need a hand. You know, the vast majority of our cows are all finished by the time we come to the end of that eight minute cycle. Um, but if we can reduce the number of cows that are getting to the end of that cycle and not finishing, not having finished their milk let down, then that saves us a fortune in time. Um, so yeah, we installed uh, a couple of units on Invent in Feb 2020, I think. And uh, then four to six weeks later, um, the whole parlor went in. And since then, it's been brilliant success. Um, I can attest to James's uh, point on line of slip. I think actually we've probably seen a reduction in line of slip since uh, Invent went in. Um, and that is on the same same liners. It was a constant battle trying to find the right liner for the herd. I think you know we went through four different sets of lines in four different liner changes before we finally settled on what we're in today. Um, and I would, I'm much more comfortable with where they are and the liner that we have chosen um, on the back of Invent being in. Um, you know, it's it's made a huge difference to liner slip and cow comfort. We don't get cows kick off. You know, we don't really use kick bars at all anymore. Um, and it's it does make the whole milking process an awful lot easier. And I think that's something, you know, we can probably attest to from ADF as a whole. Prior to sticking ADF in in 2017, um, that lad you can see st sticking units on on the far side of the picture would actually have to come across the parlour and manually dip all those cows um, about every uh, five to six stalls. So what's that, minute and a half to minute 45? Um, and what happened then was that we had a whole load of cows that then were unexpectedly getting dipped. They didn't know when the dipping was going to happen. Um, you'd scare them uh, and then they would then start to make the parlour dirty. Parlour hose would come out, parlour would have to stop. Um, if not, the cows wouldn't necessarily be great at coming on. Um, whereas now, uh, you know, we are, we take out all of that risk. Uh, we don't have to have that person uh, changing their lag time because they've got to go and dip some cows. Cows are calmer. Um, and then we reduce the risk again by having the venting in line. Um, so I think it's, you know, it's all about trying to um, give the cows a comfortable experience that they want to come into the parlor for. And the the nicer we can make that experience right from the very first milking all the way through until the last, the less teat and damage we're going to do. Um, and if we don't have that teat and damage, don't have that congestion in the teat, then we're likely to get less mastitis and we give those cows fewer reasons to leave the herd, fewer reasons to leave the herd. And we uh, might be increasing our daily lifetime, uh, daily lifetime yield um, and our yield for their life. You know, uh, I'm really striving to get to 21 litres per day of life, and I think it's more than doable. But to do that, we've got to have older cows. Um, and to have older cows, you've got to, you've just got to look after them better and we've got to give them more comfort. Um, so I think it is relatively simple. You know, it, Invent has really helped us de-risk our milking process um, and hopefully uh, will help us increase the age of our herd and, uh, and make us more profitable. Thanks. Uh, if anyone's got any questions, uh, feel free to shout. Amazing. Thank you so much, Keith. I think very remissly as your chair, I didn't say that your title was Milking Routines and How We Benefit. 
Um, but beautifully, you've presented all of that. So thank you very much. We do have a couple of questions here. Polly, sorry, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what happened there. Is everybody back? Yeah, everybody's okay. I don't know what happened there. Uh, sorry, Keith. Um, how many people do you have in the milking parlour? Uh, so we, in a morning and an afternoon milking, we'll run uh, one person, uh, what we call yarding, so uh, scraping, fetching, uh, sweeping beds and bedding up, and then one person uh, doing teat prep, uh, and one person uh, cupping and getting, you know, generally sorting some cows out, helping cows come onto the parlour when necessary. Uh, at night, uh, that moves, and uh, the person who effectively is cuffing uh, also uh, yards. So we end up having one person in the parlour for about 20 minutes a day, I guess, uh, at the start of each group at night. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and what is your best top tip for the best milking routine? Um, consistency. Just do it the same every time. You know, uh, a uh, old colleague from my previous role, uh, Pete Jackson, used to talk about boring cows into performance um, and just keeping everything the same every time. Cows love consistency. Um, and, you know, it's that's really true. Um, you know, the, the more you can get it so that's exactly the same every time, parlor turns at the same speed, you know, using the same dip, same cross, you run at the same pace it's um yeah it makes a huge difference so um and i think the other thing is just be really clean yeah it it does make a difference it does make a difference yeah so just, just cleanliness 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 and for you guys you've got a really consistent team around you as well and obviously your team are very important to the su success of the overall show aren't they really yeah i mean yeah. at the end of, at the end of the day we're uh, we've got there's six of us on the dairy um, and one person drops out and that whole dairy falls apart. So, <laughs> you know, it's, um, it really is a team effort. And we've got a question here from Rachel Porter, if that's all right, Keith. Um, was your invent system retrofitted? Did you already have the ADF clusters? Uh, we had the ADF clusters already, yeah. And um, we were lucky enough, actually, to have uh, Andy Moore, who uh, is an ADF uh, employee, who did some relief milk for us. Uh, pre-pandemic um, and so uh, yeah he was uh, we've been talking about venting in various forms for quite a long time um, and it was amazing the difference it was when it went in and um, yeah it was, it was really good. Did you fit on all clusters straight away or did you yeah, just we, do? We did two um, and Andy got his uh, in or tell us uh, what their fancy tool is to measure the uh, um, vacuum and vent in, in cluster but um, and so we could actually look, we started looking at um, some of our worst offending cows, I guess, for milking speed. Um, and so we'd make sure that we had a list of cows to go and check. And when one of those came through to one of the vented stalls, um, we had it set up. So we vented on two, didn't vent on two. And milking speed on the two quarters that were vented was dramatically better. Um, and they finished milking much quicker too. So, yeah, it was, um, it was great. Amazing. OK, well, I'm really sorry. We have got more questions, but um, I've been asked to let you know that the ADF team will feed back the answers to those questions after the webinar. Um, it's been a hugely popular evening, so I think ADF will be running more webinars, hopefully in the future. Um, it just leaves me to say apologies for being a terrible chair and letting us run over this evening. Um, but thank you so much to all of our incredible presenters tonight. Um, you've been really thought provoking. I'm sure you've left our audience with a huge amount to think about. And I'm sure when those that go out milking later, if they're three times a day or first thing in the morning, if they're twice a day, um, they'll all be thinking a lot about what you've all said this evening. Um, thanks ever so much to ADF for asking me uh, to host this evening. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, and I'll just wish you all a very good evening. And thank you very much for your time. Thanks for joining us.